you don't have one of your own, you're feel free to uh, take one of ours as a gift to you. Again, Mark 12, starting in verse 1. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit with a wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get it from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? This is the word of God. Amen. The great poet uh, T.S. Eliot once wrote, Oh, my soul, be prepared to answer him who knows how to ask questions. And no one knows how to ask a question like Jesus. I mean, I think of all the ones that he asked, even the one where he just asks, what do you want me to do for you? Which he asks so many different people who approach him. He does this because he wants to put agency back in our court, right? He cares so much about a human being. He doesn't just want to say something to them. He wants to hear from them. And so you may wonder why Dave, my friend Dave here, stopped reading the passage before it concluded. It's because Jesus has asked us a question. He means for us to, to think on it, uh, to respond for ourselves, not just the answer from teacher, right? He means for his, his hearers to put themselves in the owner's shoes, as, in God's shoes, as it were, and consider what might be his appropriate response. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Years ago, I was asked by a Christian school, many, many years ago, asked by a Christian school to come and teach on this parable uh, to their classes, to their students. And that week, I happened to be having dinner uh, on my own with our boys who were much younger at the time, our two boys, and I wanted to get their take on this parable uh, because I knew something about it. I knew that this parable was co not covered in any of the children's Bibles, Right, you hear about the multiplication of bread and fish, you may hear the parable of the lost son, but you never hear the parable of the tenants who get beaten. Right? It's just not in typical children's Bible. So not seeing it anywhere, I decided to do what any good father does, and that is get out the Legos he can find and assign them ridiculous voices and characters according to the story, all right? Now it actually turns out, I found out there is a Lego Bible a Lego children's Bible, and it does actually include this story, okay? And you can find it, if you're curious about this later, uh, thebrickbible.com. I don't know why I'm advertising this. They're not the sponsor of this sermon this morning, so I shouldn't be giving them free pub, but it is pretty, pretty funny. I also don't endorse the whole thing. Sometimes it's weird. I don't know. Whatever. It's very interesting, though. They had this story in there, which I found pretty interesting. So anyway, um, I did what Dave did in, in ending at Jesus' question as I shared this parable with him, in part because I knew they hadn't yet heard Jesus' answer, and I wanted to hear, I wanted to leave them with that cliffhanger and hear that they would respond like typical people might respond, right, to what is a typical relationship between an owner and a tenant. So how did they respond to what will the owner of the vineyard do? Here were some of our children's quotes. Uh, one of them said, beat them. Um, they also suggested, what about kick them out, keep the vineyard for themselves, and build higher fences so no one else could come in? Uh, kill them, to which another responded, man, man, that's the wrong thing to do, man. And finally, after a long pause, one set of eyes lit up because he knew how to give a good Sunday school answer. He said, oh, he's going to say, I forgive them. And they settled on it. That was going to be their final answer. Dad, this is what we're going to say. It's our final answer. And they'd been to church 
So they were a little surprised to hear Jesus' actual answer, which is, he will come and destroy the tenants. Hostility. So let's first talk this morning about God's hostility, God's just hostility toward evil, because Jesus talks about it here. When the Bible speaks of God's anger, his wrath, his just punishment, and we say it out loud, we get a little embarrassed, don't we? And we wish the person talking would move on. In fact, many of us, when we go even through our Bible reading, if you read something every day, you might move quickly past anything having to do with wrath and anger and and awfulness because we hope something good will be on the next page, right? Because it seems archaic, barbaric even, to talk about God's anger and wrath. So a lot of churches don't talk about it, even though Jesus himself is bringing it up here as we go through the Gospel of Mark together. The reality is the old covenant, the old deal God had with his people in the Old, old Testament, it had more curses than it did blessings by a count of 54 to 14. There are more references in the Bible to God's wrath than there is to his love. Why is that? Why can't a supposedly loving God just, just accept and forgive everyone and anyone? We think about that. We say that out loud, and then we will tell that to the Father, right, who watches an ISIS militant scream with an alien terror and then behead his child. Right? Tell that to families of those brainwashed to death by the likes of David Koresh and Jim Jones. Forgive everyone, accept everyone. Tell that to the daughter who asks her dad to spend time with her. And he promises to, constantly promises to show up, but he never does. To the point where she's alone, now in a foster home, waiting for anyone to show up for her. In fact, God's standards are far higher than even these bottom-of-the-barrel acts of evil. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk says of God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And so he does. He does provide justice. He does issue justice. The parable that Jesus tells here that we just read has its origins in the Old Testament prophetic book of Isaiah chapter 5. And I want us, if you will, I'm going to read part of it for us. Listen out for evidence of just punishment in this story. My beloved has a vineyard. This is from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 5. My beloved has a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with choice vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were wild and sour. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you have heard the case. You be the judges. What more could I have done to cultivate a rich harvest? What did my vineyard give me? Why did my vineyard give me wild grapes when I expected sweet ones? So this is what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will tear down its fences and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place. I will not prune the vines or hoe the ground. I will let it be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no more rain on it. This is the story of the Lord's people. They are the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. Israel and Judah are its pleasant garden. He expected them to yield a crop of justice, but instead he found only bloodshed. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of oppression. So we'll summarize, what did the owner of the vineyard do in this story? Tore down, he destroyed, he broke down, he trampled. To which we say, as we do in Jesus' parable, yes and amen, we say this because we too are made in God's image, each one of us in here. And because we're made in God's image, we, we care about justice. He is a God of justice, we care about justice, and yet, as we do so, it feels incomplete, Right? Even as you want justice for others, it feels incomplete because God cannot raise up a people being simply just and fair because none of us would stand. None of us would stand. All of us would fall short. So Jesus continues in verse 9. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants. And here comes the surprise of the story. To everyone listening, here comes the surprise of the story. He will give the vineyard to others because that is God's nature. He will judge justly and give generously. Which is crazy, right? 
Imagine if it was you, those you cared about, and it was God, by the way, because he sent his prophets. Those you cared about got assaulted. They got humiliated. You even went to the funerals of seven of your closest friends who were killed on that vineyard. What would you do? Shut down the vineyard? Most likely. Certainly you would never entrust yourself to people again. Most certainly. You build even bigger fences to keep people out of that vineyard, never to come in again. But God's very nature is to continue to give himself away in order to bring some in. In order to bring some in, which leads to our message in a nutshell this morning. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Jesus Christ crucified is the marvelous solution to all hostility. Jesus Christ crucified is the marvelous solution to all hostility. God's, ours, and theirs. God's, ours, and theirs. You can think of the cross, if you will, like a, like a sponge. And at the cross, Jesus absorbed the hostility of the righteous judge towards us. He absorbs my personal hostility and anger towards God and not wanting to do things his way. He can absorb the hostility of others towards us. And why is that? Because Jesus is the perfect tenant. He's the perfect tenant, not mentioned in our story, but hinted at. He's the perfect tenant of the time given to him on earth. He bore fruit. He gave back to the Father all credit and all glory and all fruit back to him. That was due to him. He willingly received all of his messengers, messengers like John the Baptist, but he also willingly received sinners like you and me. People who who thought they had no hope in this world, people who were outcasts, people who were put aside, he received them as well. And what happens to him? He gets torn down. He gets thrown out of Jerusalem. That's why he is crucified, by the way, outside of the walls of Jerusalem. He is destroyed so that those who trust in him would never have to be. Such a solution is worthy of the praise prophesied of Jesus. And then he mentions here from Psalm 118, which says this, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It's not a solution people expected, but it's the solution God gave. And it is truly marvelous. We're going to talk about why it's so marvelous this morning. And I'm going to start elaborating on this by sharing with you a story that some of you have heard me share once before, but I'm going to share it again because I think it's so perfect for this morning. Fiorello LaGuardia is the mayor of New York City during the Great Depression and the worst days of World War II. He was a colorful character. He used to uh, uh, ride on top of fire trucks. He used to raid speakeasies with the police. He would um, take entire orphanages to baseball games. When the New York papers, New York City papers went on strike, he would get on the radio and read the comic strips to the kids on Saturday mornings. Well, one cold night in January of 1935, he turned up at a uh, courthouse, a night court that served the poorest ward of the city, and he dismissed the judge for the night, and he took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman came before him. She was charged with stealing a loaf of bread. And she explained to LaGuardia, she said, you know, my daughter's husband deserted her. My daughter is now sick, and now my two grandchildren are starving. But the shopkeeper from whom she stole the bread refused to drop the charges. He said, look, Your Honor, it's a really bad neighborhood. And, And she has to be punished to teach everyone around us a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I have to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Justice makes no exceptions. $10 or 10 days in jail. And of course, this is 1935. $10 is a lot of money. And but even as he pronounced the sentence, the judge was already, LaGuardia was already reaching into his pocket and he stepped down from the bench and he put $10 into his famous hat And he said, here is the $10 fine, which I now pay. Friends, why can't a supposedly loving God just forgive and accept? 
How can a just God, though, let the guilty go unpunished? Jesus stepped down from heaven's judgment bench to pay the fine that we deserved. In doing so, he satisfies the hostility of God. He absorbs that hostility of God's law towards the accused. He takes away the hostility of the accuser who demands justice. He also absorbs the hostility of the offender towards her accuser. Everyone can forgive and be forgiven because someone willingly absorbed the cost. And in doing so, absorbed all the hostility with it. Jesus Christ crucified is a solution for God's hostility, God's just hostility. He's also a solution for my hostility. Jesus Christ crucified is a solution for my hostility. We got to give the religious leaders some credit in this story. They don't try to deflect Jesus' Jesus' parable on others. Read with me, if you would, in the final verse, verse 12. And they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people, for they perceived he had told the parable against them. So they left him. They went away. They get it. They get what Jesus is doing. Oh, 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 you're, you're saying this towards us. They recognize Jesus' parable is their past history. His parable is actually a thumbnail history of all of God's people. They are freely given the description, the designation, the people of God, right? They've been given a good vineyard with good laws, a good land from which God drove out seven nations. He passed over probably better candidates than them, than Israel, to be his, his country, his nation, right? He could have picked Assyria, right? He could have picked big, bad Egypt or Greece or, or sophisticated Rome and said, this is my nation, but he picked a tiny little nomadic country instead, and yet they reject him. They reject him. They reject his attempts to reconcile with him. He, did, he sends these prophets in the Old Testament. If you're wondering why the prophets are all there and there's so many of them, all of them are attempts for God to reconcile with his people, to spur them on, to show them in different creative ways, please come back to me, and yet they say no. The Bible tech tells, them, tells us the fate of two of these prophets, only two, Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, who's stoned to death, Second Chronicles 24, by his own people, Uriah, who is killed by the sword from his own people, Jeremiah 26. But rabbinic literature and history from that time Reliable history tells us the fate of many other the prophets. Amos, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Habakkuk, they're all killed at the hands of their own people. In fact, here in this parable in verse 4 when it says, one who is struck on the head, it most probably refers to John the Baptist who's also killed. You see, Jesus' parable here is their past history, but they recognize that Jesus' parable is also their present history because they've deserted Jesus. They just have in this passage, right? Remember when Jesus comes into Jerusalem? We looked at that a few weeks ago. The place is largely deserted, and he is largely rejected. So the religious leaders, they plan to destroy Jesus. They fear that following him is an all-or-nothing proposition. So the religious leaders give Jesus one more test. One more test to see if they can't still hold on to a little bit of their political power and influence. But when they realize, as we saw last week, they cannot, they will kill the son and throw him out of the vineyard. So here's the question. Do you recognize Jesus' parable as your own history? This is where it gets hard. When it comes to hostility, When it comes to anger towards God, like David of old told by his friend Nathan, we too must sometimes be told directly, thou art the man or thou art the woman. Because we we hardly want to think such a terrible parable could possibly be about us. I don't want to think about it being about me. But consider, friend, every time God the Spirit has drawn near to nudge you to come away with him. To which you've responded, no, no, no. This is my time. This is my job. This is my life. And we send him away empty-handed. Think of the times that the sixth or seventh time you had to forgive someone who's been mean and then bitter towards you. And finally, you say you've had enough. Forgiveness has its limits. 
basically spurning Jesus and his good news message and the teaching that he brought and all the forgiveness he gives you. Those times, reflect on those times you've ignored someone in need. You've just passed them by, passing the least off to someone else, not realizing you're also passing off Jesus in disguise. Friend, thou art the man. That, these are all acts of hostility. Every theologian I respect, every pastor I've sat under, every wise person I've known, godly person I've known has at some, some point admitted, hey, I've been hostile in mind towards God. I've had that feeling of hate in my heart. I was, I've been a child of wrath, and I've been sitting with that a little bit, not too quick to rush ahead to hallelujahs, which I know we're going to love to get to and sing to in a, in a little bit. Friend, don't, do not sprint ahead to the good news without sitting with the wrathful realities of both our own hearts and what we've been saved from, which the Bible says is the wrath of God. Then, and only then, can it be so sweet and that we can take comfort in the marvelous and cornerstone solution that he provides, which is to put your hostility upon Jesus Christ crucified, who willingly died to absorb your worst. Hallelujah for that. And finally, Jesus Christ crucified a solution for their hostility. The final plan concocted by the tenants in our story is strange to say the least, as are the actions of the religious leaders to whom Jesus is confronting through them. They recognize they're in the wrong here. They recognize they're under the judgment of God, yet they have no idea how to respond to that judgment other than to act with more hostility. And think about it. Sometimes that does happen, right? So they seek to arrest him, it says in verse 12. In the parable, the tenants' plan is absurd. Why don't we kill the son? And if we kill the son, the owner must give us the property. <laughs> It's weird. It's bizarre. We act as if God is some sort of deist, right? He started the world, wound it up, made a bunch of laws, and he let everyone just do their own thing, and he just can't intervene. Meanwhile, the son is hated, killed, mistreated. They say, well, he's, he's obligated to give his inheritance then to us. They acknowledge God and his judgment, yet they seek his reward with a plan of their own, of their own making while blowing off his which seems like some sort of spiritual schizophrenia in this parable, and is bizarre until I was reminded, oh, this actually isn't too unusual today either. Right? We're willing to do certain things in a kind of contract with God. We're willing to be spiritual. We're willing to be moral after the laws of God. We're willing to even pray on special occasions and show up to other special ones. We're even willing to think of heaven sometimes on somber occasions, reckoning all these things as part of a contract with God. And yet he offers his exclusive solution, which is his son. He is the way, he is the gate, he is the door. It's almost like when the world feels judgment, they kind of gnash their teeth at Jesus and then at us for representing him. People still don't know how to respond to sitting under the judgment of God. And so what we do is we say yes to a plan, to a God of our own devising, which is, oh, I have my own personal spirituality. I have my good works. But they say a vehement no to God's plan, which is his son. He's given his own son. And people don't say, oh, I don't want that Jesus crap. <laughs> but I have my own personal spirituality. I'm a pretty good person. Why? When God provides the solution a solution to actually take care of the hostility that we hold in our hearts. The testimony of the New Testament is clear. If you aim to represent Jesus, people are going to hate you too. Some people are going to really not like you all. And I'm not talking about this sort of straight up, get all up in your face kind of anger. Sometimes it's the passive aggressive hatred. It's the whisper hatred. It's the avoidance hatred. It's the I don't get invited to things hatred. It's the be the butt of little jokes set to the side kind of hatred. It's going to happen. We think like the owner of the story. In the story, surely they will respect me, but many will hate us too. The question is, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with hatred? What are you going to do with bitterness that's aimed your way? Because none of us bear the weight well, do we? 
Some of us just try to come up with our own solution to hatred, which is putting ourselves behind the bench as judge and jury, which is similarly a weight we cannot bear, right? Because the, with every word we judge others, that same word becomes the measure by which we're going to be judged. We can't bear that. The things I think in my heart sometimes towards others, man, if those same standards were applied to me, I would fall short. That doesn't work either. The marvelous solution is putting their hostility upon Jesus Christ crucified. That's why Jesus is so insistent to share with his followers, guys, it's not you they hate. It's me. They hated me first. It's me. It's why only he can bear the weight of their hostility. So God gives us a very practical way, by the way, to do this. In, in the Old Testament, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of prayers called the Psalms. And among those Psalms, there's a special kind of Psalms called imprecatory Psalms. And if you read them, they'll startle you with anger. And they're so angry, you won't even believe it. But you start to realize as you read the Psalms that, oh, only God is able to bear the weight of the hostility I experience. Does that make sense? I can't actually do it, bear it myself. I need God to bear it. Let me read to you one of these Psalms from Psalm 69. Here's one of them. This guy's experienced a lot of hatred. So he says, pour out your indignation upon them. Let your burning anger, Lord, overtake them. Remember, he's just praying this to God. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in your tents. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. And you're shocked by this language until you realize it's a personal prayer. The guy feels anger, and he's putting that anger back on God. He's putting it in God's hands. Notice how he concludes his thought. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. If that sounds familiar, it's quoted in Romans chapter 15, verse 3. It's quoted in the New Testament to refer to Jesus. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. It refers to Jesus. The same thing happens in Psalms like Psalm 2, Psalm 22, Psalm 110. In other words, these Psalms put the weight of our own hostility and those of others back on God, and nearly all of them are messianic psalms. That's no accident. They're messianic psalms. They refer, they're predicting also Jesus because God was preparing for us a marvelous solution from the beginning, a marvelous solution for all hostility. Jesus Christ crucified, justice and mercy satisfied, the cornerstone upon which he builds his church. The power to show mercy to others and lead the judgment of hostility to God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this parable. It's a hard one to think about what you're saying here when you talk about destroying the tenants. But you don't stop there. You also say, I'm going to give the vineyard to others. And we're thankful, Jesus, that in the cross, the cornerstone, mercy and justice are both satisfied. That at the cross, you absorb the hostility of God's law towards us. You absorb the hostility of our, <clears throat> our hostility towards you and the hostility of others, Lord, that we can't bear ourselves all of that can come back to the cross. We can bring back to you, Jesus, so that we can sh live our lives showing mercy to others and not judging them in our hearts. We're so grateful that you provided Jesus Christ crucified. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to go there, willing to take on that punishment, willing to be destroyed so that those who trust you wouldn't ever have to be. We're grateful for that. Thank you, Jesus.